So welcome everyone to Public Policy Projects webinar, where we will be discussing um, our reflections on PPP's Going Further for Wound Healing Programme and the priorities for 2024. Uh, my name is Armin Asachi. I'm a Senior Partnership and Policy Manager at PPP. And our chair today is the Right Honourable Stephen Dorrell. So I'll hand over to Stephen. Um, and thank you very much and uh, welcome everyone to this uh, webinar on uh, what is often an, regarded as an unfashionable subject, but actually is a hugely important subject uh, if the thing that motivates us and the thing that we care about is delivering better experience of life as a result of healthcare for the people who rely on our services. Uh, and so I'm delighted to be chairing this webinar, looking forward to the programme of work that we in PPP uh, intend to do during 2024 uh, to follow through the work that Amina did with support from uh, many of the people on this uh, webinar and including some of the panellists uh, did uh, last year uh, leading up to the wound care conference that we held at the back end of last year, uh, the purpose of which was to bring together people who understand the importance of this issue and understand both the costs, the, the financial cost and the human cost of the approach to wound care that so often is the experience of people with long-term wound, uh, suffering from long-term wounds, which is that if you can cover it up, it'll go away. And that's, of course, exactly how not to deal uh, with this subject. Uh, I have been exposed to it uh, both as a health minister a very long time ago. You, those with, uh, uh, if if you remember the time when I was a health minister, then you should uh, keep <laughs> quiet about it. It's uh, uh, too long ago to be decent. Uh, but it, uh, sadly, this is a subject that was talked about then, and is still talked about today in very similar terms. And that, of course, is part of the problem. It isn't that uh, we are waiting for the latest scientific advance to tell us how to deliver proper wound care. Uh, we know the answer to that. It's just that we don't do it. Uh, and the, the challenge, therefore, is to identify uh, the what good wound care looks like and then hold ourselves to account, not just in areas, individual areas of excellence, but across the health and care system to deliver uh, better wound care for those who suffer from long-term wound conditions. Because if we don't do that, we're losing an opportunity to improve quality of life for those individuals, and we're wasting significant amounts of money. So there's both a need, there should be a professional obligation and a professional incentive to deliver high quality wound care. And also there's an economic incentive because better wound care actually delivers, it, it's some, so many branches of medicine, uh, uh, the, the best is quite expensive. In wound care, ironically, the best is very often, not always, but very often cheaper than the poor quality that we end up delivering. So we deliver a service that is bad for patients and unaffordably bad for the healthcare system. And the question for this year's work that Amina is going to be leading is how to address, how to uh, identify good practice and challenge those who are responsible for delivering wound care services to use good practice to improve outcomes for their patients and to deliver uh, the better value uh, that that offers uh, for the healthcare system and therefore for the taxpayer. So those are the themes that we talked about uh, at the conference last year. And the challenge is how to, uh, it's, it's words are cheap as they say, it's how to take what we know is good and uh, what we know about how to do it and challenge ourselves to deliver better than we have yet demonstrated that we can do. Now, having said all of that, 
Um, ah, the, the, Kirsty, you moved to a different point on my screen. So I was panicking, thinking that you disappeared. <laughs> And I was now going to have to keep going because just before the webinar started, I said to uh, Kersey, and I'm not going to even attempt, I'm afraid, to pronounce your second name, Kersey. Uh, but no uh, and Kersey came to our uh, conference at the end of last year. Uh, she is the president of the European Wound um, uh, Wound, and I'll get this title right. And she's the head of Helsinki Wound Healing Center at Helsinki University Hospital, and she's the president of the European Wound Management Association. So I said before she we opened this uh, the webinar that Kirsi has forgotten more about this subject than I will ever know, and I'm looking forward, Kirsi, to hearing um, y hearing your expertise and hearing most importantly how. Uh, in uh, in Finland and uh, in your personal view, how we can actually apply what we know to the benefit of our patients, because that so often is what I think we fail to do in this field. Kirsi, you're extremely welcome. Thank you for joining us. We look forward to what you have to say. Thank you, Stephen, for your kind words. And it's an honor for me to be here. And, and I will share my slides and could you confirm if you can see my slides now can indeed yes yeah yeah great so it is my pleasure to be here and indeed i'm the president of yuma and i'm i have the honor to work in the multidisciplinary team in helsinki university hospital and and today i will give you some thoughts about Yuma, Yuma and collaboration with public policy projects and, and the ones that Stephen already uh, brought us thoughts about how, how could we improve. And, and one of my favorite sayings is that the cheapest wound is the healed wound. And then some, some words about Yuma. What is Yuma? Yuma is a European non, not-for-profit umbrella organization. And, and as you can see, we have several objectives. We, we try to improve wound care across Europe through different incentives. And one of the, those is advocacy, as PPP is very strongly doing also. Uh, and we are extremely happy with this collaboration as we can learn from each other. And and uh, besides advocacy, we need also uh, research activities, publications, expert panels, educational materials, and cooperation with international and national societies. And one of the things I think Stefan already uh, spoke about is the implementation. We have a lot of guidelines. We know how to treat the wounds, but how do we implement that? And I think that the focus in the near future should be in primary care, as in many European countries, patients come first to the primary care. Here, just briefly, the cooperating organizations in different European countries, we are collaborate collaborating with and all these cooperating organizations are invited to the annual congress of Yuma where they have their representatives and then we have international collaboration as well. From my point of view, from one of my president objectives and, and also what I learned in Finland is uh, that the one of the most important things is the early diagnostics, uh, because uh, referring to earlier studies, many patients may visit primary care centers uh, weeks after weeks without diagnostics. And I'm sure that NAS as a vascular surgeon also agrees uh, with me with this one. And, and that is why we uh, wrote this lower leg ulcer diagnostics document that was published and it's freely accessible at Yuma website. And it, it tries to give in a very concise way the, 
the necessary steps for accurate diagnostics also in primary care. We have this uh, one page as well. Uh, and in a simpler way, you could say that with every wound patient, you should exclude three eyes. That is infection, ischemia, insulin, that is diabetes, and then ADP, atypical causes, distension, that is lecidema, and pressure injury. As more and more uh, wounds are getting multi-etiological uh, these days in clinical practice, you seldomly see a pure venous leg also anymore. The, the patients have several etiologies and several comorbidities as well. But as in primary care, you have shortage of time, you have shortage of resources, you should have like some simple tools and, and simple advice when to refer the patient to specialist care. And Yuma has also focused on compression therapy as with uh, almost um, any lower leg ulcer with, without critical ischemia or severe cardiac insufficiency should be treated with compression therapy. And this is one cornerstone. And this we know, but how about the implementation? We are still working on that one. But that, that is why Yuma has also this... Um, simple in infographics and videos at the website to improve uh, the use of compression. As in many cases, if the patient goes to the primary care and, and he has like a simple uh, ulcer in lower leg, and if the compression therapy is started right away, then the healing of course is faster and we do not have so many problems. So we should hit hard, hit hard and hit early. And then, of course, I have to give you a teaser about Yuma London, in the 1st to 3rd of May in uh, this year. And we are, Yuma is organizing the conference with cooperation with the Society of Tissue Viability. And I'm happy to announce that we have there an advocacy session with, um, uh, with collaboration with PPP. You see Amene, Alison, Sam Everetton, and Goel, Yuna Adeli there in the panel. And, and this is something we want to go forward also with the initiative with PPP to inspire for action, to, to discuss what else we could do. This is a long journey, but every step counts. Thank you. This is what I wanted to say briefly, and I'm happy to answer any questions afterwards. Can I say, thank you very much indeed uh, for, for your introduction. Uh, and uh, that was gets, gets us off to a really great start. And, uh, and we're uh, delighted that you, uh, you and Yuma uh, support us and we appreciate your support in the work that we do and uh, we absolutely think it's it's something that I personally feel strongly about and it's I think it's in the DNA of of PPP forgive all the um, letters uh, that uh, we should be learning from experience elsewhere in Europe as well as the uh, 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 applying our own uh, our own ideas, contributing ideas, hopefully, but learning from other people's experience. So thank you very much, Kirsty. Um, I'm going to go next, if I may, to Christine O'Connor, who is the uh, business lead for Coloplast uh, and who reflects the fact uh, that uh, in PPP, we don't apologise for the fact uh, that we work with uh, across the public-private divide on the basis that whether you work in uh, pharma in digital or in uh, supplies, like, as in the case of Coloplast, uh, we're all engaged in the same endeavour and we all have something to contribute uh, to the discussion about how to deliver high quality, good value services to our patients. So Christine O'Connor is the National Commercial Strategy Lead for Coloplast and uh, we're grateful for the support of Coloplast 
for this work. And uh, we look forward to what you have to say, Christine. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I'd like to first of all say uh, that I felt that the um, original conference and the original round date tables were absolutely uh, a major breakthrough in terms of moving the agenda forward. Um, but my major concern for the original um, conference was the fact that when you looked at the audience, it almost felt like we were preaching to the converted that actually many of the people who were in the audience were already on board with the messages we were trying to take forward. And that for many people out there in the ICBs and place and in neighborhoods, actually wound care is in the hard box. It's in the hard box and the role of industry, and I feel very privileged to be representing industry tonight, is to actually take that message hard and strong into the world of integrated care boards to actually begin to get wound care fairly and squarely on the agenda. So some of the words I want to say tonight are about that, are about what are the key priorities, and also to say that industry are 100% supportive of everything that PPP are trying to do in this arena and will continue to be so. Um, one of the things I will say, and I'm sure David will pick me up on this at the end, is that uh, dressing spend is not the big ticket item. Uh, it's the smallest part of the cost of delivering wound care. And the big ticket item, of course, is the cost of community nurses and practice nurses and guest work absolutely highlighted that 80% of the cost of delivering wound care sits in the capacity in the in the actual uh, healthcare professional box, which is a high contributor now to the capacity challenge that we face on a day to day basis. And for me, it's the ICBs, places, neighbourhoods need to recognise that unless we bring a focus onto uh, the escalating costs of wound care, then they will continue to escalate. They will not go down. And if you look at guest work, five years ago, he was saying 8.3 billion. If you, ask, if you actually push that forward now, my guess is we're kind of working in a ballpark figure of about 11 billion at least I would have said um, and the only way we're going to shift this as as Kersey rightly said is to shift from managing and maintaining wounds to healing wounds because the cheapest wound is a healed wound and that and that brings us to another challenge which is that on upskilling staff because we just don't have enough staff so need we then move into the area of needing to upskill staff um, and exacerbate the focus on, on healing rather than managing, because we've got lots of people out there who are absolutely managing wounds and not actually healing. There was a question earlier about, uh, I noticed before we started, around the prevention and care gender. Can we actually deliver both together? I think if we get the shift uh, around what we're trying to do out there, that actually we have a responsibility to pursue both agendas. And I think Naz will talk about every, every, um, every contact counts, and that is helping shift us towards that prevention agenda. Equally, I think National Wound Care Strategy Programme has focused heavily on uh, the lower limb area, uh, as Kersey's shown today, lower limb is really important. If we could crack that one, 80% of our wounds are lower limb and they are becoming more complex. Lymphovenous wounds, for instance, and the understanding of how we deal with that. Uh, so I think we've got to recognize that they actually, wound care sits along the high risk areas. Anybody in the audience wants to tell me that wound care is nothing to do with cardiovascular disease, is nothing to do with diabetes, is nothing to do with obesity. I'd like to take that challenge on the chin actually, uh, because there's directly linked. So I think at the end of the day, for us to move this agenda forward, we've got to somehow get the focus to the next level with our commissioners to help them to understand that by dealing with this specific area, actually, it will help solve some of their financial and capacity challenges. And there you go. That's what I've got to say tonight. And I look forward to questions. Well, Christine, that's great. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you. I, I wholeheartedly agree with you. Uh, that this is a you said uh, anyone on this webinar who thinks there's no link between uh, wounds uh, uh, wound care and long-term wound conditions and diabetes 
Um, well, uh, I, I hope there's nobody that rises to that challenge because I can't believe there's anybody joining a, a webinar on uh, wound care uh, who would wish to uh, maintain that argument. But if they are, of course, this is a free country and we look forward to hearing that point of view. <laughs> next time. Absolutely. Uh, um, but uh, before we get to that, uh, uh, having heard from a professional lead from outside Britain, um, which uh, you know, emphasising that this is a, a, a shared challenge across healthcare systems across Europe, uh, heard from uh, yourself as a representative of the industry. Uh, next, I'm, I'm going to turn to Naz Ahmed, who's a consultant vascular surgeon at Manchester University uh, uh, Hospital Trust. Uh, and Naz, one of the questions in the chat that uh, must be at the heart of your practice is the, the number of cases, as uh, both Kirsty and Christine have said, uh, where opportunities have been missed for early intervention and prevention. And the number of cases that come to you as a hospital doctor uh, that actually should never have been anywhere near a hospital uh, if the condition had been uh, properly understood and properly uh, uh, dealt with and, and cured, because so often in healthcare these days, it isn't about cure, it's about manage management. In this case, it can in many, many cases, be about cure. It's about lost opportunities for cure. That must be one of the great frustrations of your life. Absolutely. Uh, thank you for the invitation, Stephen, and, and, and Amin as well. I just want to iterate what uh, Kirsi and Christine were saying. The uh, the conference uh, last year was, uh, I found it, I've been to quite a few conferences, and I think this was one of the first conferences where we had such a, a, a multidisciplinary approach. We had people not only from nursing, uh, but also from we had, we had commissioners there, we had finance there, we had various other people, uh, you know, um, there as well. So it was the first time where we had everybody in the same room, and we had a quite a quite a detailed uh, discussion about uh, you know how can we actually move things forward. And I think this is one of the strengths of, of PPP in relation to many other conferences. So, con so congratulations on that, and, and I also look forward to working with you guys uh, in in the coming year. I just want to highlight some of the work that we've done in Manchester and some of the language that we use that to, to help uh, in, um, get um, wound care into the five-year plan for the ICB. Now, for many of you are aware, so Manchester is, is in the northwest of England, is one of the first uh, areas where we had a devolved health budget. And with that, um, we had a couple of assumptions when, when I when, when, when myself and the team developed this wound care program, which is, let's assume that everybody knows how to treat wounds. And let's assume there's no money in the system. And let's assume that nobody's got any time to do anything. With, the, with those three as a starting point, can we do things differently to improve wound care? And can we get the language right so that commissioners and system leads understand what we want to do? And what we found is, number one, nobody really understands wounds. Nobody really knows what a foot ulcer is or a leg ulcer is or let alone lymphedema. And when it comes to dressings, nobody really kind of understands uh, what it uh, involves, but the professionals do. Whenever you speak to, um, you know, uh, system leads about commissioning and we, we need this amount of money for this, the clinical argument is always won because we're the experts. But the problem is the finance and how do we actually do it? And how do we change that language? So we had a simple approach. We know that the best um, approach to improving wound care is a multidisciplinary approach. And we know this from di from diabetic foot care. So if you treat diabetic foot care with vascular, with diabetes, with podiatry, with nursing, all in the same room, all seeing the same person at the same time, uh, outcomes dramatically improve for, the, for those people with wounds. So the answer, so the argument was simple. Why not level up care to the diabetes standard for everyone with wounds without, without uh, affecting diabetes care? And how do we do that uh, without any additional resource and how do you make that possible? So I'm pleased to report that over the last five years, this is what we've been doing within uh, within one particular locality of Greater Manchester. And we've proven our results by, uh, across the whole of Greater Manchester, amputation went down by 21%. But in Salford, our primary area, they went down by 42%. And Salford is the third most deprived area within, uh, within Greater Manchester. And the most affluent area, amputation went down by 20%, and we did it by 42%. So we, so we reduced that inequality as well. 
the language we use, well, the language is not of wound care, but the language of amputations, because people understand what an amputation is. And most amputations begin with a wound of some kind. So um, so that, that was sort of the, the language that we used. We demonstrated reduction in uh, inequality of outcome, and we did that by levelling of care. Now, how did we level up care within existing resource is exactly what Christine and, and Kirsty were saying, which is we, we train people up to so that they're working at the top of their level. So band three works literally right at the top of band three up to band four level, band five worked up to level of band six and so on and so forth. We also train people up to organize scans uh, uh, to, so podiatrists in my particular, so podiatrists organize uh, duplex scans, CT scans and MR scans. So in the MDT clinic, we managed to reduce the number of appointments for patients and by reducing the number of appointments, we increased capacity and that multiplied up, allowed us to be able to level up wound care. We then presented an argument of inequality of, you know, provision, access and outcome to the ICB. And when we gave them the data with financial data from the from uh, the wound care strategy, that is what enabled us to be able to get it onto the uh, five year strategy for Greater Manchester. Um, as Stephen was saying, um, Prevention is a massive part of what we're doing as well. I don't want to, we, we, dis, we can discuss that later on, but in a nutshell, that's what we did. We changed the language from wounds to amputations and from finance and all that kind of stuff to inequality because the in, inequality is a responsibility for the ICB. That's a language that commissioners understand. And by changing the language, we were able to change the agenda. Thank you. Can I just ask, I'm, I'm going to abuse the chair's privilege now, uh, the, the chair's <laughs> position, because uh, the, it changed the language. But uh, I just wonder how many uh, in, in in what your experience is in Salford, uh, area I know reasonably well, actually, um, you were improving the experience of indi of residents of Salford, of the of the care provided for, to, uh, for wounds by the NHS. Now, what was the, what was it that made the difference? Was it that you was it professional education? Was it the commissioners? Uh, was it, uh, what was the the thing that made forty the the forty percent improvement in Salford? as against the 20% improvement, I'm guessing, in in South Manchester or uh, one of the fashionable areas. Yeah, quite. You obviously know Manchester very well. <laughs> um, so I think that there are three things. Uh, number one is culture. Uh, you've got to get everybody on board. So in a room, you need to have podiatrists, nurses, commissioners, finance leads. You need to get everybody in the same room to be able to understand what the problem is that we are trying to fix and then everybody brings their own arguments of so the language of finance is different to the language of clinicians which is different to the language of commissioners although they're all kind of linked we need everybody to understand what the uh, what the problem is so that, that uh, and bringing um harmonization of culture and uh, and um and the aim is is number one number two it's understanding what can you stop doing uh to increase capacity and that took a whole load of uh, you know, agreement from people of what what they don't need to do anymore, uh, and I can give some examples of that. For, for example, many uh, podiatrists, podiatry teams do routine nail cutting, which we said, you know, that's not high risk stuff. We need to stop that. Uh, many nurses, for example, once they had healed uh, a wound in a patient, will say, okay, I'll see you back again in six months' time, just to see how you're doing. We stopped doing that and said we put it on the patient. Say if there's a problem, come to us. Here's our numbers. We, we made we, we made open access easier. Uh, so those are the three things, really. It's about uh, unified vision. It's about stopping doing stuff that you don't need to do. And it's about uh, 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 training people up to be able to be more competent in, in their skills. And also, you know, people need to let go of some of their stuff. There's a there's a phrase called terminal uniqueness when you're speaking with particular people in a service where they think my service is so special, nothing can change. And you don't really understand our service. So I think we need to, we, we had to do a lot of work to overcome what we call terminal uniqueness as well. And once people put their barriers down and tea and cake helps enormously, I found. So it's simple <laughs> conversations and, you know, where it's open and honest. And we uh, I will stop talking very shortly. Um, and, and the key thing is understanding the paradoxes within the system. So many nurses, for example, can do, uh, say, an ABPI or something like that, but they won't do it because they fear that if they get it wrong, they'll lose their pin, they'll lose their registration. 
So the system had to give confidence to people to be able to do things differently. So it's sitting down, understanding the paradoxes that people have and actually uh, addressing those paradoxes head on. Terminal uniqueness. I shall take that away from this uh, uh, this <laughs> webinar uh, because, uh, yeah, I know exactly what you mean. Um, nobody's ever encountered a problem quite like the problem I deal with here. And I have nothing to learn from anyone uh, outside Manchester or certainly outside the UK. No, that's that's the um, that's nonsense. Terminal uniqueness, David Lawson something never been seen in the Department of Health and Social Care, I'm sure. Um, but David, you're very welcome. You're Director of, of Strategy and Me of the Medical Technology Directorate at the DHSC. And um, so how, what, does, what do ministers or people in, in your position actually doing things, rather than just talking about it, what... Uh, what which levers can you pull uh to uh, to mean that to we ch that these things change in the way that we're talking about that's a good question i've got some slides but because of time i'll i'll probably just talk and yeah. partly because i'm not familiar with zoom it'll probably take me 10 minutes to work out how to show the slides i i, I think i mean from a i mean just in terms of my background so i've I'm quite new into the department. I was previously at Guys and Tommies for 21 years in a procurement role. So I've, I've come into the department with that kind of perspective. So I, I, I certainly recognize the terminal uniqueness um, from, from working within a teaching hospital. I, I think from a, a ministerial level, a political level, what the, the key thing that I've seen is, a, I guess, a focus on innovation and the frustration around why we're brilliant at innovation but not so good at adoption at scale. And it seems to be, you know, the, one of the ministers kind of, his kind of catchphrase is that there's, there's more pilots in the NHS than BA. <laughs> so they're very good at innovation but not so good um, at adopt, adoption at scale. I guess one of the things that we are trying to do is to and it kind of builds on Christine's point around recognizing that the product cost is in many ways a small part of the cost of a pathway. And med tech has a kind of almost like a unique ability to transform a pathway if the if the most effective med tech is deployed. And so this is about, I guess, from where, where we're trying to translate this is, is to think about value-based procurement principles. So not a race to the bottom in terms of cost, lowest cost, but understanding the true value of product. So there's two, I guess, two areas that we're working on specifically. So my role within the department is as MedTech director. So last year there was a, a MedTech strategy that which was published and there's, there's two particular areas. So in terms of how, in terms of wound care, so in terms of secondary care, one one of the kind of frequent feedback we 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 receive from industry is a frustration around the difficulty in convincing the system, um, whether it's at a trust level or an ICS system level, about the positive impact of a product in terms of influence in the patient pathway, and it goes back to this challenge around applying value-based procurement principles. So. We are due with it next month, in fact, to release a draft methodology where we would look to apply value-based procurement principles systematically into um, how the NHS buys. So not, not just at a trust level, but also at a national level in terms of NHS supply chain and their framework. So it, it, at a basic level, whereas at the moment you, you have examples of national framework agreements where price is say weighted at 75 percent which means it's very hard for the qualitative out, output factors to be factored in to to have a, a weighting for quality out qualitative factors to be set at at, at, at least 60 percent and then within that having set domains with standardized questions um, to Kind of draw out what are the benefits what are the outcome benefits of, of of different products so we intend to release that next month as a draft methodology invite industry and invite 
colleagues from procurement community to you know critique that approach and then with the aim to kind of finalize that later this year so i guess one way we're trying to move the dial would be to apply a systematic approach to embedding value-based procurement principles into um, how we buy and i guess for med tech um, 90 percent of med tech is is bought at a local level so although some med tech is commissioned nationally the majority of med tech is 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 kind of you know chosen selected adopted at a local level so value-based procurement is one approach the, the, the other mechanism we're working through is a review of the part nine tariff so the part nine tariff covers the uh, med tech products including wound care which are prescribed in the community so that's about 15 percent of med tech spends about 1.4 billion a year so we we, we've int- we launched a tar- targeted consultation um, late last year, and the, the the focus of the proposal is, I guess, is to have a, an approach which enables us to have an active management of what products are listed, um, and to within that to enable us to focus on value as part of that decision making process. So that's the kind of other way that we're trying to change the way that we we. We, we, we look at products, so we don't just think about the products in terms of its unit cost, but understand its its wider value. Um, there are other initiatives within the MedTech strategy, particularly around data. So one of the challenges we have with MedTech is the data um, that is available is often of poor quality. So having, having basic things such as a, a national uh, PIM, a product information management system, to provide a single source of truth to provide greater clarity and data, updating how we categorize um, uh, different products, um, which have, again, for wound care, I'm conscious of the work of the National Wound Care Strategy. Um, so there's, there's other stuff around data to give us visibility. Um, but I guess if I think about what's our main priority this year, it's probably around trying to embed value-based procurement in terms of decision-making. And, and we see that almost as a, a kind of culture change. Um, so if I just think of the procurement community, there's about 4,000 uh, procurement practitioners out there in the NHS. And we need to kind of get their buy-in to, to operate in this way. And equally, we need to make sure that we set up mechanisms that um, don't add unnecessary burden to industry as well. Because because the, the great danger of, um, making changes is that you, you do it for the best intentions but then you end up um, creating more problems than, than or un, unintended consequences so that we're also very conscious of making sure we're not creating unnecessary burden to industry but i'll stop there i'm happy to take questions and i'm conscious of the time david thank you very much your permanent secretary sir christopher wormold i used to know when he was i think i'm right saying it education this is a long time ago now and I saw him about a week before after he became permanent secretary of the Department of Health. He said, I don't know much about health, but I know one thing. We haven't got an innovation problem. We've got a second adopter problem. Uh, and I think that's yeah. pretty much exactly what you said. That, that uh, We've got uh, lots and lots of people who know what good looks like, but very few people who are willing uh, to apply lessons learnt by others. Um uh, and that, I guess, uh, Amina, am I reading out the questions that are coming in? Because uh, there's a couple of questions in the Q&A. Uh, what I suggest we do is rather than doing each question individually because we and then go around every panellist, because we shan't get through many that way. If I read out what uh, some of the questions and indeed some of the comments and then ask the panel panellists to comment on them. Uh, the core question that's sort of underlying really all of this conversation is the first question in the Q&A. How can variation in the commissioning of wound care in primary care be addressed? Um, it, it, this is it, perhaps it's, it's not just about primary care, is it? But it's importantly about primary care. How can we address the variation of outcome um, and uh, empower it, it's partly about commissioning, it must be. Uh, it's also about uh, professional education and professional accountability. What is the role of the GP in this process? Kirsi put a comment in the in the chat 
uh, about specialized wound centers that uh, a, a, a is one answer uh, but i guess that raises the question doesn't it uh, whether these are to what extent it is we need specialized centers and to what extent we should seek to generalize professional education and professional practice uh, to in, so that it, it, we're not expecting people to leave their communities to get care that ought to be available uh, relatively close to home. Uh, and then the, the second question in the Q&A, how can we leverage healing data in uh, WMDS uh, to drive an understanding of the value of wound care products centrally? So again, it's about understanding what delivers good outcomes. Uh, there's a range of themes there. I think I'm right saying, Amina, that we don't have the capacity to ask people to speak live, do we, questioners, uh, on this this version of Zoom? No, we no. don't. No. no, okay. So I'm. Uh, it's, uh, I hope I've uh, read out a reasonable cross-section. Kirsty, why don't you go first in answer to some of those points? Thank you. I, I was thinking about that variation, and I agree that specialization is not so simple, but on the other hand, when we are speaking about such a group of patients that go to primary care, for instance, three times a week. So we, we've um, discussed this a lot with our commissioners and administrators and, and said that with this patient group, it makes sense to specialize a little bit so that uh, that uh, the, the GP and the tissue viability nurse and the podiatrist are educated more in wound care. And, and in Helsinki area, we have this specialized primary care wound center that serves the whole Helsinki area. And it's, it's working pretty well. And, and they do also the triage that, of course, if they feel that this cannot be treated only in primary care, then the GP knows when to refer the patient to specialist care. And, and uh, from Helsinki area, uh, they can send freely the patients the, uh, to, to that center. So, so that, that kind of solution might work in, in some areas because we realize that also that, for instance, medical students, they get very little education in wound care during their medical students. That, that is not enough. You, ne you need more if you want to treat these patients successfully. Thank you. Thank you, Kirsty. I'm going to go to Nas next. I, I wonder, you, you could probably tell us the answer to this, Nas. I'm t we're told that medical students don't learn anything about uh, uh, wound care. And in a, then you go to another conference and I'm told they get they do a week on dermatology. So they must do something in the course of their medical course. Uh, their... Yeah, I mean, they, we don't do enough is a, is a bottom line. And even if you did do it at medical school, once you practice, you're five years out of date yeah. very quickly. So I think yeah. it's a continuing education uh, that it, that is important. But I, I fully agree with, with, with Kersey when, when it comes to, uh, to education. I think um, each area, uh, again, just to build on what David is saying, it is about implementation. We know how to treat wounds and we know that multidisciplinary care uh, is the right way to do it. And we've got a, an infrastructure already within, within the UK around diabetic foot care, which isn't perfect everywhere, admittedly. But that approach uh, um, is, uh, is, is, I think, what we should build on. And all we need to do is to improve access to these MDT clinics that are already going on there and make sure the pathways in and out of those are right. And everybody is trained. We've and never got the right technology and all the value based procurement arguments are all absolutely right. So I think we already have a strategy, which is all we need to do is increase access to what we know already works. And then framing it, the problem around that way becomes a commissioner problem because then that inequality is a commissioner problem because they, uh, for example, within Salford is a 220,000 population. Um, and within Greater Manchester, we've got 10 localities of uh, 2.8 million altogether. Each locality is about 250, you know, 300,000, some of them. They've all got unique problems. So you need to understand what the unique problem is within that area. But from an ICB level, it's all their problem. It's the inequality. And um, then you can sort of do a top-down approach. And I think the evidence, you're right. I mean, there's a, there's a whole problem getting the right amount of evidence and all that kind of stuff. And within Greater Manchester, we have four and a half thousand people with 7,000 wounds that are addressed on average twice a week. That's 14,000 
wound dressings every week across Greater Manchester and applying Julian Guest aid. There's about, that's about £300 million a year that we're spending just on a wound care. But if you use Julian Guest data, uh, you know, the costs double if you look at chronic disease management as well of their diabetes, their ischemic heart disease, all that kind of stuff. So what we need to do is not also not just manage the patient's wound, but manage the patient themselves as well. And also you've got to look at around the context that they live in. So you need to bring the economic argument as well. And, you know, economic improvement in areas increase their ability to have good nutrition. You know, within Greater Manchester, you know, a third of our kids live in poverty. And, you know, many of my patients choose between coming to see me in clinic and the taxi fares and heating their home. So you can't really talk yeah. about improving wound care and all that kind of stuff when there's problems like that. So that's why it needs a whole systems approach. And that is, of course, exactly building on the the example of Greater Manchester and the integration of healthcare into the the range of public services. That's exactly what ICBs and ICSs are supposed to to do. Uh, and I'm going to go to Christine. Christine's put her hand up. So, Christine. Thanks, uh, thanks, Stephen. Um, do you know, uh, in our world that we live in, it's always easy to find a reason why not, isn't it? It's always easy to find the reason why you can't. There's not enough resources, there's not enough money, et cetera, et cetera. A couple of things to take on board that uh, currently the management of wounds, whichever way you want to look at it, doesn't sit within a GP contract. However, we have these vehicles called PCNs. We're moving to integrated neighborhood teams. These are just great opportunities to look at how we do something differently in terms of uh, producing facilities to deliver good solid wound care from prevention through to the end point of healing where necessary and how patients manage themselves going forward. And I think commissioners have really got to begin to accept that this is a critical area for them to look at. It's not a, an also ran. There's huge amounts of money, as Nas, Nas has identified, being spent on this area, which if they addressed it, would release resources to do other things. And I'm 100% behind what David's saying about value-based procurement. But I think we've got to recognize where we are and, and that we, we've actually got to approach this differently. I'm going to go to David, but I'm going to link it to actually the question that Amina has asked in the chat, which I think is it's not it's not the whole answer by any means, but is an important step along this road. Amina asked the question, who is measuring the inequalities in wound care locally? How many ICBs actually know that they have inequalities? And because first question, if you're going to solve a problem, first, you have to understand that you've got it. So uh, that might be something that the department might take an interest in, David. Thank you. I, I mean, it kind of reflects my my comment, which we, we, you only know what you know. And without the data to expose that variation and that cost, then you're going to have variation. So the, the, the challenge for ICS is and at a national level is there's, the, the, there's too many things to do. So the, the everyone has to prioritize. So maybe the challenge for wound care is how 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 can wound care elevate itself to be shown that has, you know, been more important by by ha having that data to kind of um, make make that case. So th there's something about data, I think, to, to make the ch make the opportunity visible. Um, and once that opportunity is visible, then that should be the catalyst to enable ICSs to, to kind of recognize the opportunity I, my, my other kind of reflection is that there may be some learning from secondary care where you've got the outcome registries program which is all about um, providing visibility over kind of surgical activity and then using that data to kind of drive um, improvement so the, there's some there's perhaps some learning in secondary care that can be applied to primary care about getting data and then using that data to expose um, I guess the term is unwarranted variation, um, but 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 I think and I think that's needed in order for ICSs to kind of get it to understand the the current costs of the current um, uh, you know the current variation in practice where um, I think everyone on this seminar is uh, webinar is probably already converted to recognizing that 
you know, the, the opportunity or the lost opportunity. So I think it's about visibility of the challenge and then and then using that to elevate it. When when wound care is having to compete against multiple other kind of priorities and challenges. Naz, I'm going to come to you next, but can, uh, following on from this, I mean, uh, the, the focus on data, identifying the problem, exposing, surfacing the problem, that must be part of raising the profile here. Um, it, it just seems to me that this ought to be relatively rather easier to, uh, for, to gather data and measure and actually have some evident, uh, out, uh, evidence of outcome in wound care that is it's easier to measure than the the contrast i was thinking of for example in mental health uh, you it's quite difficult in mental health to identify um uh, more difficult anyway than i would have thought the new move but you may please feel free to tell me i'm wrong uh, what do i know but you it, it ought to be shouldn't it relatively easy to identify things that can be measured can be reported and can be used to demonstrate the scale of the problem and hopefully that we're doing something about it i fully agree it should be easy um because it's it's a wound it's something you can see something you can measure um, I wish it was that easy from GP data. Uh, it's it, it the and the main issue we've got is double counting, because it's many people uh, uh, will identify a wound that is there, but once it's healed, they don't switch off the counter as it were. So for, so the following year, that patient that patient still got a wound, even though it might be healed. So after five years, you may have that that patient plus a new year's patients plus that year three you've got year one plus year two patients. So what one issue of double counting is the problem. Uh, to it, get a, a, a proper idea of how many ulcers there are and therefore calculating costs. What we did within Greater Manchester was look at hospital data and say, what is the cost of treating a foot ulcer in hospital? And what is the cost of treating a leg ulcer in hospital? And what we found is that the cost of treating a foot ulcer is about a million pounds a year across Greater Manchester, whereas the cost of treating a leg ulcer in Greater Manchester in hospital cost alone is 20 million, is 20 times more. Now, there's some, you know, uh, you've got to understand what that data was actually telling you. But what, what the way we interpreted it was that if you've got if you've got good care in the community, you get uh, you get fewer cases going into hospital. So we managed to use, sort of use the data that we have and and to bring a story uh, uh, together. So that's so you're absolutely right. I think hospital data is, um, you know, uh, easier to measure than GP data, particularly around uh, wound care. And then you can start putting some costs to that. But the point I wanted to make was uh, the way we got it onto the agenda around inequality was that we said to the ICB, you need to fix inequality. Wound care is a great example of your pilot project to do it across the region. We've got a massive problem. We can put some cost to it. We've got the National Wound Care Strategy business case, which says that for every £1 you spend, you get £9.80 back beginning within two years. Got your whole district nurse issues uh, as well. So let wound care be your project that you can demonstrate improvement. And I think coming with a problem with finance and coming with a solution as well that's linked to inequality. I mean, we did it to amputation because that's what you know people understand, but that's how we did it. And I think um, getting the language right, as I mentioned before, I think it is really key uh, to this. Thank you, uh, Christine. You've got your hand up, and then I'm going to I come have... back to you, Kirsty, uh, after Christine. Just to, uh, I'd really be interested in a different healthcare system. Uh, do you feel you're better at measuring and, and tracking progress? And how do you uh, have you got some something for us to learn the how to measure? But anyway, uh, Christine first. Yeah. I, I just I just before we continue with data, I just wanted to add in another component. And I know Legs Matter uh, pursues this with a vengeance, and that's the cause of harm. It's causing harm. So if you've got a waiting list or, or a backlog of patients waiting to be seen with wounds that are deteriorating, that falls into the category of harm because those patients are not being seen. If we're using inappropriate dressings that are not working effectively towards, um, towards healing because patients are being managed by people who need to be upskilled, that's harm. And there are policies now being pushed down from NHS England around the whole issue of harm. So it's not just money, it's the 
issue for the individual patients themselves and the harm that may have been being caused to them by poor service. And is there a linkage there, uh, come, come to Kirsty in a second, a linkage with the, the whole patient safety theme that there is, uh, that the system is is not addressing the, the safety agenda if effectively in wound Absolutely. care? Absolutely. Yeah. You, get, you could move into the safeguarding area with some very severe issues around there. But I certainly know that Legs Matter have been pushing this for many, many years already and there's, and continue to do so. But it, but we can't forget that little bit that mm. actually the harm bit is in there in, in terms of poor care. So, Kirsty, how do you you've solved all these problems in, in Helsinki? No, unfortunately not. I'm sorry to disappoint you, but we have the same problems. It is extremely difficult to to measure the cost for for the the total cost because you have so many aspects. Also the sick leaves and so on. I totally agree with Nas that it is not easy. Uh, we are building a national registry right now that could solve some some of the issues, but we have challenges with that one also, and, and we are just building it. But the one aspect we we decided to do that, uh, I have a PhD student that, that, that is a GP working in primary care, and, and she has been studying the delays in 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 patient referral and and that that is one aspect and and also the other study that we have just sent for publication where we saw uh, where we show that in primary care when you have the early diagnostics the earlier the diagnostics uh, the shorter the healing time and from that one you can um, you can like think that yes the cost of course are also smaller as you don't have so many visits those are some aspects that you you can show to the commissioners that is very important the role of primary care uh, the specialized wound care centers to reduce the delays in diagnostics thank you, thank you. I, somebody's asked the question that i'm afraid we're getting uh, um, disturbance on the line from helsinki but uh, anyway we, we could hear what you said thank you um david is there something here for the department uh, there's uh, uh, it was a big theme in our conference last year uh, that we don't there's uh, there isn't enough data and actually if there was better quality data and in particular as ja as Nas says from primary care from gp data if there was better data we'd have a better definition of the problem and we'd be able to target resources more effectively at dealing with it? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's an element of the MedTech strategy from med tech strategy from last year, which kind of termed it as enabling infrastructure, but it was very much about data to give you visibility. Uh, there is a connection into, I think, the outcome registry program, which we are funding, and which was commissioned on the back of the Baroness Cumberbridge um, report into patient safety. So I think there is some obvious links into building from the work, from the outcome registry work and what the objectives and aims are and how that can be applied um, into primary care. I'm conscious of the National Wound Care Strategy also we're looking at this kind of question about how, how best to kind of capture the information. Um, whether a registry is the most appropriate mechanism, don't know. But I think it... I, for me, without data, you you know how how could you possibly, you know, create the prioritization, convey the argument to to to, to progress um, these issues of inequality where you've got pockets of excellence around the country, but you, we 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 seem to fail at being able to adopt good practice consistently right across the country. And I think the only way we can do that is by having the data to expose that. Okay, I'm going to. Be, we're coming to the end of our time, unless Amina has uh, a specific question. She's you've spotted Amina in the. I'm I'm going to just ask. Can I go round the panelists uh, for thirty seconds of reflection before we draw the webinar to a close? Go to uh, Christine first, uh, and Naz second, David uh, third, and and Kirsi last. So Christine, 
Yeah. So basically, I think this has been a great opportunity to build on what's been done previously. Commitment of industry is there 100% to support the direction of travel we need to go in and uh, more, bring more, PPP, bring more. We'll certainly try. Naz? I just want to echo that. I think um, we need a whole systems approach to wound care, which is working across public health, community, hospital, procurement, academia, and digital. And I think we need all those people uh, in the same room when it comes to finding solutions, both uh, locally, regionally, and nationally. Well, amen to that. And that comes from the man from Manchester who where, the, where <laughs> these ideas started. So in, in, I'm not sure that's quite true. But anyway, uh, pioneers in this space. Uh, David? I, I think the positive for me is that I think we know the answers. So the challenge is an adoption challenge. That, that's what we need. That, if, if you're looking at priorities for the next 12 months, it's how can we adopt what we know is to be work? How do we adopt it consistently across the system? I wholeheartedly agree with you, but isn't it almost humiliating to say that? We know the answers and we just don't do it. Well, if, 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 if um, at least by recognising that as the challenge, we can try and address it. Yeah, indeed. Okay. And Kirsty, I agree with all the former speakers, and perhaps one angle more would be the patient's voice. Because if we have like strong patient organisations, they could do also for some advocacy, and to and to confirm the commissioners and the administrative persons. Thank you. Thank you very much. And and those who were present at the conference we did last year will remember a really very very powerful uh, patient contribution. Uh, from somebody whose life had been totally misshaped uh, by uh, scandalously bad um, uh, wound care, scandalously and unnecessarily bad wound care that had simply, uh, I, I don't remember as much, I, I, remember the, I remember the emotional power rather than the detail. Uh, but I remember it was a life with 10 years missing because the, the because we didn't do what we know we could do if we just got off our backsides and done it. Uh, so it was a, uh, your point that you the patient's voice often makes the um, makes the argument more compellingly than any amount of, of uh, expert opinion. Um, so th thank you very much to our panelists. To, to Naz, to Christine, to David, and to Kirsi. Thank you again to Amina for uh, the work you do for PPP, Amina, in uh, bringing this community together. And it is something we're not going to let go of uh, because it's it it's at the heart of the, our uh, desire uh, to deliver better care and by delivering better care to demonstrate that actually better care is more affordable than the bad care we too often end up delivering. Um, that's uh, a, a thought to close on. Thank you very much for your contributions uh, to this webinar. Thank you, everyone. And we've put in the chat that we do have a webinar on the 25th of March. So please do um, join us for that as well. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Good night.